Um, okay, so this evening's talk is by Gary Sexy Zeng. Some of you will know Gary already from teaching. Uh, he teaches with us now, very glad to say, on the MFA Fine Art. Um, Gary's uh, exhibited a lot internationally, recently co produced uh, an opera called Dead Cat, Bounce. Dead Cat Bounce, thank you, with Clara Coffin, with Clara Coffin which is at Somerset House. Uh, and again, as with Baha last week, I'm interested in having Gary in this talks program because he's, um, I think it's a kind of, as I was saying with Baha, a sort of model of an artist, which is, I think, very different to what we expect certainly the modern artist to be, and I think certain versions of the contemporary artist, because uh, Gary's not just not only doing his practice, as you would expect, like audiovisual practice or objects or images and so on, but is also heavily involved in generating new discourses operating in a kind of talk space, operating through uh, social media and, and also through uh, kind of speculative strategies as well. Um, and Gary's most recent um, publication, I think, is going to be Future Art Ecologies 3, Ecosystems 3. Uh, Gary co-wrote this with Victoria Vanova. And if you don't know the Future Art Ecosystems project, it's based from the Serpentine. And they developed a research and development unit quite, I think, a new, it's a new thing in the art system where they're trying to understand what the new technologies mean, digital technologies mean for art institutions and for art production, not just in institutions, but artists anyway. Um, and Gary's uh, was, was involved in writing this edition of it. You can get them online. Uh, so there's three of them. The first one was about, oh, I can't remember, it's quite a while ago now. General arts industry, thinking about arts as a that's it, yeah. So art, art, yeah, art is an infrastructure in its kind of digital ecology. The second one was about art in the metaverse. And the third one is about art and distributed systems, um, so, which you might know from blockchain, DAOs, and so on. Um, and it's a really incredible piece of thinking and writing about how distributed models change the kind of power, power organization of the art system and the kind of possibilities that are thrown up by that, not just within a city, but internationally and transnationally. Um, I don't think Gary's gonna be talking about this directly, um, but the talk he's doing is based on his research around finance and especially insurance, uh, which is, I think, a way that um, this condition of polycrisis or permacrisis, or a constant ongoing sense of catastrophe, gets operationalized and turned into, gets gamified by financial sectors. Um, so we can bring up some of the issues in that through the Q&A, but with that, I'll hand over to Gary. Don't bump into these people as you're coming up. To the, don't want you knocked out before the talk starts. All right, thanks, Gary. Yep. Um, hi, thank you for the invitation, Suhail. Um, I'm just gonna switch these over to my slides. Um, okay, so it's not really going to be an artist talk, um, but it is some stuff that I've been working on for the last few years. I'll try and like I'm going to try and I'm going to try and hit the kind of like key points while also trying to tell it as a bit of a story, uh, which it I guess is. Um, and yeah, okay, let's, let's just see. Um, so let's see. It also is all pretty much folding into this book that's coming out in May. So this is why this is kind of a big sprawling presentation. And I'll try and make it through in time. So three years ago or so, um, I was doing a residency in London, and which was the longest stint I spent in London at the time. And um, I met a psychiatrist at the Delfina Foundation called Isabel Valley. And we go into a conversation about psychosis, which is what she worked on. And specifically, she was working on the dopamine system, uh, which is basically part of what the dopamine system does is it's a neurotransmitter which can like attach importance to events and experiences. I mean, it does many things, as I'm probably giving a very, very limited account of what dopamine or psychosis symptoms are like. But um, the part that was interesting to me at the time was how narrative is constructed through experience. So when you have a, psychosis is basically when you lose touch with reality. Like it's, it's very, very, 
broad seeming as a set of symptoms. Um, it's basically when what you believe is considered delusional to others and also what you believe seems delusional within your own context as well. Um, and so I got kind of interested in this idea of how do narratives come together. Uh, and it's, it, especially res with respect to time, which was something I was already thinking about, and with respect to forecasting, prediction processes, um, and also thinking about time as a kind of more constructive process. Because I was also, actually at the time, I was you know, in conversation with friends like Bahar and also with um, you know, actually reading some of Suhail's work. Um, where I think there was a lot of quite interesting thinking around finance as a set of tools and a, and a kind of technical process, which was in part about constraining time. So when you, when you put a price on something, you're deciding, you and many other people are deciding what you think this thing's going to cost in the future. And you're factoring that, factoring that in to your decisions now. Thus, Can you speak about those, Sarah? Okay. Huh? Yeah, sure. I'll try and I might just have to mean awkwardly forwards. Um, yeah, so just as a simple version of that, you know, the act of pricing in a marketplace is a kind of temporal kind of gesture which shapes the course of time in the collective process of doing so. And collectively, you might end up constraining particular timelines and like sort of, in a, in a way I've been thinking about it almost as a form of like engineering of um, shaping of timelines. So that's just like a vague preamble to um, something hopefully it'll be a little bit tighter. That's where it started. Uh, oh yeah, the, the other reason that Isabel was interesting here is that actually this project was a series of strange trails where Isabel introduced me to a few of her friends um, who worked in things like catastrophe modeling and uh, in uh, financial markets and also um, in regulation. And through that is really stumbling around and my own circumstances of just bumping into people is really how this project kind of came together. Um, okay, so this is a picture I saw this morning on, on the internet. It's, um, um, it's a TikTok by a Brazilian pop star um, because her boyfriend is the grandson of Robert F. Kennedy, the uh, brother, so relative of JFK, who is now a big anti-vaxxer, and Robert's grandson has recently uh, gone and, um, to fight at the front in Ukraine, despite having no military training whatsoever. But he says he can carry heavy things. And um, the Brazilian pop star, who seems to be very, very big in Brazil, there's a picture of them with, together with Lula, um, is has been very dotingly posting heroic videos and posting pictures of herself crying. And it's, it was just a nice kind of little funny little nexus of like different historical sort of signifiers falling into place on the kind of very strange timeline that we have now in that kind of social media way. So I, I mean, one of the questions I've been kind of thinking a little bit about is what era are we in? Or like what, what kind of makes an era in a sense? Um, so I, I put together a, a timeline, um, which kind of roughly goes from like 1960 or so to, to now, to like a, little, a couple of speculative moments in the future. And like most of it is kind of um, related in some way to, you know, kind of macro scale events. Like whether they're small events or big events, they're events that had like a sort of considerable impact. So, um, <coughs> And then sort of try and think, thinking a bit about like well, these kind of bigger narrative names that we've given to recent kind of like episodes of a recent history, like the end of history, which is another word, if you like, for kind of the liberal democratic globalization narrative, uh, neoliberalism, which is another word for this kind of particular stage of like deregulation that we've seen mostly since the 70s and 80s. Um, ecological narratives like the Great Acceleration, which is linked to the Anthropocene, um, which roughly from 1952 or so. Um, climate crisis, which arguably has not, you know, has obviously been a situation for a very long time, but doesn't seem to have appeared so much in the very, like, public consciousness until relatively more recently. Um, and then you've got these kind of more economic moments, like the Great Moderation, which was a period between the 80s and the two, and 2008 crisis, where basically Western inflation didn't really go up. So prices remained stable, 
Like then, and these kind of things became quite important. You know, like this was a, a series of conditions that allowed um, daily life to continue as relatively normal, even though the world was crazy and different and changing as it so often, you know, usually is. Oh no, this thing that reminds me to look at a tree every so often <laughs> has turned on. Uh, I'm going to turn that off. Um, um, so what I started thinking a lot about was like these kind of what we think about as normality versus say delusion versus say conspiracy is often like a, these islands of temporal stability. Uh, ignore that. Um, and and what you know when when that stability starts to fall away, which arguably in recent years it has, it kind of makes you ask like what put it together to begin with. Like what what is what, what are these kind of like anchorages of uh, temporal, you know, normality? Uh, here are just some more timelines, you know, like um, macroeconomic events in terms of global trade, uh, political narratives, nationalist moments, uh, the internet. Um, so, I mean, in a way, what this was reminding me was the, this idea of cognitive mapping. Um, so Frederick Jameson, the Marxist, Marxist literary critic, um, he writes about cognitive mapping as the impossible task of reconciling individual subjective experience with the world system. Yeah, oh, this is actually, sorry, this is me writing the quote to him. Um, yet reconcile it must produces conspiracy, says Jameson, as an imperfect mediatory and allegorical structure for the whole, a partial trail through the system in which the existential furniture of everyday life finds itself slowly transformed into a communications technology. So this is a bit mixed between me quoting Jameson, but um, the idea here being that in, his, in the time of his writing, in particular in the 80s, where they were really looking more at kind of the mass consumer commodification of culture and looking at architecture and the sort of surfaces of aesthetic cultures uh, as an example of um, how Oh, as he says, like everyday life becomes this kind of conspiracy because you never know, like any object appears to be something that could be owned by a bigger structure, it could be owned by a bigger structure that appears is actually linked to like a place somewhere else in the world or a production somewhere else in the world. So for Jameson at the time, they were um, writing especially about this kind of idea of the commodification of space and how that basically makes the world of signification very, very confusing or very difficult to map. And he has this one nice quote by him where he says something like, you reach a point where if an experience is individual, therefore authentic, oh, sorry, if it's, it's like if it's individual, therefore authentic, then it's not, act it is not an accurate or objectively real account of reality. If it is a systematically like objective account of reality, then it cannot feel real or, or authentic. He's basically having this trouble with scale. Is everything okay? Um, so, <clears throat> um, yeah, the, the, the situation with cognitive mapping, which Jameson took from um, Kevin Lynch, uh, an urban theorist, who was basically asking people how do they, how do they experience city space? How do they mentally uh, navigate the city? How do they imagine the shortest paths or the meaningful routes around urban space? And he used that. Uh, imaginary mapping of a, of a locale to think about how the individuals relate themselves and map themselves to the world system. But they, they were talking mostly about space. And I wanted to kind of start thinking about this a little bit more in time and like how do you kind of like join up the different dots in, in at least like personal memory and historical time uh, that helps you make sense of belonging to a particular history or belonging to a particular era or indeed probably what you might, and the sort of narrative structure you might need to make sense of your own identity within a social space, or in, maybe to think about, you know, the future. Um, this is a, a quote that comes from Diane Bauer, um, cohesion was meant to hold that reality started to slide, which was uh, an inspiring quote for this uh, chapter in the book. Um, so this is kind of roughly the question that I was thinking about. So how do the conditions of contemporary planetary crisis shape the genres of temporal experience that make up the present? What happens when the background of our world building, the temporalities we took for granted, assert themselves as protagonists? 
So the most obvious example of this is the Anthropocene, where you know this idea of a, a kind of passive nature that was there for exploitation, that was going to always hold up our structures, that was always going to be stable for us in some way, was um, it gets turns out to be not so not so stable, not so easy to predict, and not so kind of accommodating to various forms of intervention. Um, so yes, this is this is roughly beginning to think about time as a structure and as a technology. Um, Speaking of which, okay. um, so I started thinking about what what is this kind of what what are the kind of like layers of temporal structuring that um, allow particular forms of stability to hold. Like what if if t this begins from the fact that time is quite um, or rather making sense of where we are now in the world. Um, it feels disorienting because the scales of processes between <laughs> social, political, ecological, economic, longer historical durée, is it the Cold War again, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, which schedule are we on? That, that feels quite like a disorienting process um, at the moment. And uh, it took me to this quote um, by Laurent Bellon, who's an affect theorist, who develops this idea called cruel optimism which she's really mostly talking about the kind of roughly that kind of neoliberal decades of, of history. And cruel optimism, she says, is a relation um, of cruel optimism exists when something you desire is actually an obstacle to your flourishing. A person or a world finds itself bound to a situation of profound threats that is at the same time profoundly confirming. Um, and what she's talking about here is kind of the idea of a good life. And if you think about it in very simple generational terms, she's talking about the contradiction between, let's say, an American who's gr who grew up in the 1990s, uh, who saw their parents develop, you know, become wealthy, have like a quote, what is the idea of a good life? And then holds on to that as the standard on the, the, the aspiration of what it means to asp uh, aspire and achieve and live well in the world. And even... That, that is something that you hold on to, even as though the world around you and the conditions of making that good life totally crumble away. Even though like the kind of actual material structures that enabled, let's say, this person's parents to uh, build up a particular narrative of what it meant to live well, um, the, the, f those conditions may fall away, but the kind of psychics, the psychological scene of that um, existence still lives on for many people and arguably for, you know, decades to come. Um, and Berlon calls this an optimism, not in the sense that, uh, that you feel like ever hopeful or you're joyful about where your situation is, but it's, she talks about it in terms of an optimistic attachment where basically you may be, you may not be thriving, you may not even be surviving particularly well, but you can still have an attachment to what you feel like is the right way to uh, a, a, a good condition of existence. As there is still a kind of like um, shared imaginary around what it means to live in a particular social structure. Um, okay, this is like a, I, I, I drew some sort of simple explanatory diagrams today. Um, so you can see how there's a happy face at the top, but it's dotted lines because that is the projected desire but actually, the sad face is at the bottom, which is the actual conditions of what's happened. And then in the middle is where you get roughly this idea of an optimism, a kind of a, a, a gap between aspiration and um, actuality. Um, so back to this kind of temporal structure, I, use, I kind of thought about Berlant in terms of, um, you know, this, she, what she's talking about is this idea of a temporal stability. It's, so she's still kind of talking about a, 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 a possibility of creating a sense of stable narrative, which is not necessarily held together by anything other than uh, a, a certain kind of sociological imaginary, um, even and, and certainly not by the material conditions that actually created and made that imaginary possible. And so that kind of felt to me like a sort of very localized layer that almost everyone could on some level um, appreciate. Um, so now I was thinking a bit about larger time structures. This is a quite famous diagram by the kind of eco hippie uh, thought leader, Stuart Brand, um, which is always 
you know, it's quite a striking, it's quite a useful diagram. It's one way to think about the, the different paces of change in different types of structures. And so I was kind of like playing around with that and I ended up just kind of, it's not very, it's not very radical. It's just like, you know, different layers of the, from sort of nested cascades of like, um, historical structures that hold up particular conditions and make them possible. So the way of thinking about this was like, you have maybe psychological and social conditions that people experience as part of um, their lives, um, that they usually held together in some kind of like national to international political economic structure uh, based around some kind of, you know, some kind of basically um, uh, different varieties of politics from uh, connecting to the populace. And then you've got like larger technocratic structures of international trade, uh, macroeconomics, geopolitics, how people are doing. Um, uh, underneath that, things like international law and like these kinds of structures which do get contravened. And once they contravene, you're kind of like, getting, but you're kind of getting lower and lower into the world. I mean, I. I I'll explain how I came to this a bit later. And then at the bottom, there's this, I just put nature there because Nate in quotes, because it's kind of just like where we put all the stuff we don't want to think about, like the externalities of almost everything else just get piled into, um, you know, the rest of the environment. Mm, so this is kind of the direction the talk is going in. Um, so it's this idea that what happens when um, this, arguably nested set of structures with arguably um, dif relatively differentiated, let's say disciplinary practices or different kinds of professions that deal with them. What happens when they, they kind of, you actually realize they kind of start folding into each other. Michel Serre, the, the, the French philosopher of science, has this good image of like thinking about time as like a dough, like a bread dough that's like needed um, he's like sort of imagining it need, being kneaded into a ball and kneaded over and over again. So rather than this being linear thing, it's like the points of contact and the surface of the dough are like forming new points and new kind of interactions all the time. It's like kind of churning in on itself. I think Ted Chang has a, the sci-fi writer Ted Chang has a story about the Tower of Babel, which has a similar kind of feeling of like, yeah, thinking about these kind of different um, topologies of time. Okay. so. Now we go into like a slightly historical bit and please um, please raise your hand to correct me or if you're something you really, really don't follow um, because it's this is kind of just like, I've been kind of trying to make some sense of uh, this, um, just reading around like anyone else. So um, not not saying it's bulletproof. Um, okay, so you got these layers and we're gonna kind of slowly go down the layers of thinking about what kind of produces these temporal structures. So the first story is roughly this chart, which is the financialization of the US economy after the 1970s. Um, so the most kind of brutal way to think about this is that um, the fire industries, like finance, finance, insurance, and real estate were a bigger share of GDP than manufacturing by the mid to late 1980s. By the 2000s, General Motors was making more money selling loans than it was selling cars. And so if you just think about how that process of in about 30 years, um, the world's leading manufacturing power and just only real power after the Second World War, after the US was throwing money at everyone in the world and also building a huge amount and you know, having a huge kind of industrial boom which you can kind of see up here after 1950, you know, much higher in the manufacturing side, is slowly um, declining or quite rapidly declining really and replacing that GDP growth, that kind of economic value with um, uh, forms of uh, financial products of loans, insurance, credits, um, and, and so on. Um, and so that's part of this, uh, oh, so actually, I'll go back. Um, that's kind of broadly part of a story which sees um, the, the reason for that being able to happen is that after the 1970s, um, manufacturing shifts worldwide to, you know, significantly to China, to like other parts of what are called emerging market economies. And cheap good, because of the kind of beginning of like trade liberalization and globalization, you know, what we call globalization <laughs> is significantly a kind of Western US led 
um, idea of opening up trade borders with all countries in the world. While not opening, importantly, not opening up um, political borders, not opening up, you, know, you still need visas to go from like uh, anywhere in Asia to like be in the US or something, but they do ha want to like tap into um, labor markets and production markets all around the world. So that what that does is creates a very, very cheap source of goods for um, predominantly because the US was such a huge consumer in the world and such created so many big export markets everywhere, uh, predominantly for the US. I and mean, we're going to focus a little bit on the US here because it is the kind of leading and defining uh, economy for, for this structure. And so what that means on the kind of like on the ground um, is that even though the US was a declining manufacturing power, even though its, its industries were kind of slowly falling away and you know, classic cases in places like Detroit, um, it was able to keep, uh, hold, uh, keep hold of like relatively cheap goods. It was able to like continue maintaining uh, low prices. The 1970s saw a wave of, you, know, you might often hear people compare now in the UK as well as in the US to the 1970s because the 70s was uh, a very significant series of inflation um, spikes, like really, really intense inf price inflation, partly triggered by geopolitical effects in the Middle East and over oil. Uh, and also um, the last kind of great wave of the labor movements. So like and labor power today is much, much weaker than as in union, organized labor, unionized union power, which, you know, obviously we're seeing this amazing movement around the UK now and also somewhat in the US. But in realistic terms, the percentage of people and uh, percentage of industries that are organized and unionized are much, much lower. And I can't remember the statistic, but I think it's like a few, a few multiples. Um, so the 70s also saw the, the, the last kind of way, a great wave of um, organized labor movements. Um, and then after that, we enter in this, to this period, which famously between uh, Deng Xiaoping in China with Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan and so on, you get this kind of wave of uh, deregulation across the major economies, trade liberalization, cheap export markets, and, and so on. Um, so, but we're not trying to get the whole economic story here. It's just I, the bit I was kind of trying to pin down on what this means for uh, keeping a, a kind of relatively stable idea of, especially in the US, of like a high growth uh, or at least like a continually growing economy with relatively um, with access to cheap goods and with with a with without kind of uh, with with a kind of reasonable cost of living and um, a, a general sense of prosperity, which is I guess what I'm talking about in terms of the good life. Um, so uh, Marx talks about capital as the annihilation of space by time, um, because capital has to grow and extend to new markets all the time, but at the same time it needs to cut down the temporal barriers to that kind of process. Um, I've been kind of thinking a little bit about finance in terms of the annihilation of time by contingency, because speculative financial markets, which is what, you know, the opening of, oh yeah, an important thing that happened in the 70s is the opening up also of derivative markets, as Suhail knows a lot more than I do about. Um, and so like uh, ways to trade securities, financial instruments that are based upon the prices of underlying things. And, you know, you often get this image of like financial securities that are increasingly untethered from their underlying values. So you might have uh, the price of oil, the price of wheat or something underneath, but um, the, the various kinds of futures and options and so on that you can buy on, on that price, so there are different contracts derived from that and then maybe further derivations and further derivations until you have this incredibly large amount of money uh, like um, sort of virtually at stake on, on top of like particular kind of price movements. So speculative finance relies on generating contingency in order to, to profit as well, because without different expectations on the future, you can't really um, uh, make a gain on you know, those expectations. Um, so what happens over this period, uh, at least um, in the kind of quite useful phrasing of an economist called Ben Ansel, is this idea of a switch from employment dominance. I think you see this in the UK as well, significantly, um, from employment dominance to asset dominance. So it's a shift from an, econ uh, an economic life, which is based around the, the, the kind of struggle, if you like, between, um, it, it, between workers and employers over things like the price of labor, i.e. wages, 
uh, where social welfare and wage security is like part of the kind of um, the, this kind of equation and where let's say tools like the labor movement and social security are how people kind of fight for what matters in, to, to their kind of uh, stability and also uh, what, what they may be able to fall back on. And then things like price inflation are, are significant kind of, you know, can be significant problems for, for this form of stability. And so the idea is that after the kind of, from between like, after period after the 70s into the 80s to the, um, you have this kind of handover Rather, sorry, no, not in the 80s, from the 80s and then going forwards, you have this handover from a kind of uh, a life in which macro, um, you feel macroeconomic shocks through things like the, the price of labor, things like wages. Um, you see like job cuts and, and so on. Uh, but then instead you have a shift from that towards something called the Ben Ansel calls asset dominance, which is basically a life which is less centered around the struggle between labor and employment. Uh, but more around asset ownership. So your sense of stability is more to do with your piece of the overall stock market, whether that's through your pension fund or through your mortgage, uh, through, through the um, ownership of a house at all, which is increasingly a source of cash for people remortgaging their house. Uh, this is all very much related to the fact that credit becomes increasingly cheap. So... Um, <clears throat> borrowing money for very, very low rates and being able to rely on a hugely leveraged amount of credit becomes a source of wealth and also of like, temporal stability. Um, and in this context, basically the idea is that in this handover, as people's, the, the key economic concern becomes less to do with uh, the traditional struggle around labor and more to do with whether or not you have a piece of the asset market um, this changes also the, uh, the political concerns. It, this changes, it gives politicians, at least in the US of this time, an easy palliative to um, basically uh, quell um, economic um, strife by arranging for cheap credits. And it also gives, uh, it means that voters and um, yeah, uh, political constituencies um, are more interested in political arrangements that maintain the stock market and maintain the price of their pensions and the price of their mortgages and the price of their houses than they are to, in um, uh, the, 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 the price of wages. Um, so when we jump forward to 2008, which has kind of ended this period called the Great Moderation, which borrowing was extremely, well, it didn't end it exactly, but it put a milestone on that period where borrowing was extremely cheap, where uh, a policy that became known as the Greenspan put by uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan meant that basically stock markets were constantly being um, bolstered by um, uh, central bank monetary policy. After this period uh, came 2008, which I won't repeat the story now, probably people have seen the big shorts, you know, a gigantically over leveraged American mortgage market where people made huge amounts of money selling huge loans to people who they knew couldn't afford them. Eventually, the stack of cards kind of toppled and triggered uh, an economic um, ricochet around the world and triggered a massive recession globally, which was only really flawed by China, which was the only one still growing at the time. Um, so after this point, we have this thing about quantitative easing, which I won't go too much into, but basically liquidity provision, i.e. injecting money into the economy to buy up bad assets, became the main, uh, Adam Tews calls it the, the slogan under which central banks now backstop the entire financial system on a near permanent basis. And so this idea of a backstop became quite important to what I was thinking about. So, you know, what are the backstops at these various layers of, of the structure. Um, so after 2008, um, rather than this kind of pulling the rug from this, this, uh, this particular fin like global financial arrangement, et cetera, especially in the US economy, it actually kind of turned out that it was like basically rugs all the way down. It was like nonstop backstopping um, from US central banks and also maintain this tradition of rich countries at the time doing quantitative easing and just uh, buying up um, assets when, when it was necessary. Um, so you can see from this that um, a couple of things happen. 
Oh, shit. I've got to go quicker. A um, couple of things happen. Mostly the stock market just never stops falling. I mean, you have a couple of recessions, but it's kind of crazy to see the, the stock market here go from uh, 1950, 2011, and then after that, it go, even really just keeps going even higher. Um, and then if you look at tech stocks in particular, because after 2008, the incredibly low uh, borrowing rates and basically lack of the ability to earn money off interests from any major bank meant that people went into riskier and riskier stocks. If you go tech stocks, they go even more crazy. NASDAQ is an index that mostly works through tech. And you kind of go between 2000 and, you know, 2020, it increases like, what, eight times or something? Um, so this creates this kind of particular, this, this might be slightly more relatable. This, this creates this particular era of technology that we've kind of known over the last 15 years or so, which is when also it just so happens smartphones, uh, geolocation, people have a computer all the time on them, apps, interfaces with the world. This, this kind of era also, you know, launches around then just technologically. Um, this is a presentation by the legendary Masayoshi Son, the leader of SoftBank. Uh, the direct, who, which is one of the biggest investment firms and conglomerates in Japan, which uh, together with Saudi Arabia arranges for these like, I think total about 150 billion or something worth of investment called the Vision Fund, which is the main force behind things like WeWork, significantly Uber, DoorDash, uh, Didi, all sorts of these like new kind of uh, uh, relatively new apps that attempt to become monopolies over the last 15 years. So it, SoftBank's presentations are incredible. It, it, they're, they're, his, his presentations are legendary for this, these kinds of slides. They're very, they really send a message. Um, but this kind of uh, over and uh, uh, incredible ambition um, built mostly on a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy of like just credit, getting more credit, because once you have such a large investment um, as like the Saudi Wealth Fund and as like SoftBank puts into certain things, you, you, you kind of create um, a sense of momentum that turns something that was highly unlikely into almost an inevitability because there's too much invested on it. Um, so this made me kind of think a little uh, about, about um, I don't know how many of these characters, how many, how many people recognize more than three people on this, on this slide? Four? Five? <laughs> Nice. <laughs> um, um, it's also created like culturally this interesting era of like, um, I think of as the kind of grifter founder and Elon Musk is kind of the, class, uh, the, the uh, a more complex epitome of one of these. Um, but basically there's, we've had this kind of obsession lately with narratives around um, th these guys have all possibly will already have or will become Netflix series. Two of them at least are. Three of them are. I'm sure there will be a fourth. You know, this, this is Sam Bankman-Fried who ran the crypto exchange FTX. Uh, Elizabeth Holmes who ran the multi-billion dollar Henry Kissinger endorsed blood com testing company, Theranos. Uh, Anna Delvey who sort of managed to trick her way into New York high society by pretending she was a very rich person, etc. There's this kind of interesting narrative that's forming around. I, I think of them almost as anti-heroes because there's something faintly on, it's not really about kind of, a, a, you know, they, they seem that they're these people who represent the kind of the, the most aspirational set of ambitions of the market. And when they turn out to be frauds, it's almost like they at least saw through the system and tried um, and tried to kind of play the game. And to an extent played it incredibly well and showed how even the most august institutions from like Henry Kissinger to JP Morgan, who are in the market, are enthralled to a particular sort of fetish, if you like, um, which they, they, they kind of become. They become the proposition that's so good it can't help but be true. Um, so this is a beautiful quote from Sam Bankman Fried uh, about FTX. Um, so he says, like, now all of a sudden everyone's like, wow. People, so he's talking about a crypto exchange. Uh, people just decide to put $200 million in the box. That's a pretty cool box, right? Like this is a valuable box as demonstrated by all the money that people have apparently decided should be in the box. And who, should, uh, who are we to say that they're wrong about that? Like, you know, this is, I mean, boxes can be great. You're just like, well, I'm in the Ponzi business and it's pretty good. 
And this was like a good year, speaking to Bloomberg, a good year before FTX was found for defrauding customers for billions and billions of dollars. This was just kind of the norms of like crypto world yield farming out at that time. Um, just kind of fascinating. Okay, we're gonna like, how long have I got left? Uh, it's like quarter past. Okay, that's doable. Oh. Um, so we'll just briefly jump down to the kind of lower layer of um, macroeconomics. So to run you through very, very quickly, it's of, of some significance. Um, after the war, there was a monetary system established around the world at a place called Bretton Woods, which became known as the Bretton Woods system, which is basically the dollar being the world's, uh, the world currency. The dollar was exchangeable for gold. This was a world in very unstable post-war, um, well, mid-war, late-war situation. Uh, and um, there was many arguments, very complicated, lots of people have written about it, but uh, what came out of that was the, the dollar becoming, the, uh, the US saying everyone's currencies can be fixed to the price of the dollar. And when you come and like fix it to the dollar, you, can, you, get, you can exchange it for dollars, which can also be exchanged for gold. So everything is essentially te uh, tethered to uh, gold via the dollar at a fixed rate. So you didn't have this kind of exchange rate stuff where the price of yen and the price of pounds and the price of lira at the time or something were constantly kind of changing with each other, depending on who was buying up that currency out of the market. Everything was just at a fixed price. And so you kind of had this world in which um, the rest of the world is kind of swallowed up by the US's military system. And that was called Bretton Woods. Um, after that, you got something that became called Bretton Woods too, which is like a slightly more complicated version of that, where um, basically they decided to liberate exchange <laughs> rates. They decided to, that the dollar would not no longer be the kind of um, anchor for, for everything. So uh, currencies were free floating with each other and could, could be, uh, the, the exchange rate between currencies uh, could move to any, any point. And this was, uh, but this wasn't really a sort of massive switch from the dollar system because everyone got very nervous. Everyone had loads of dollars anyway. There were lots of offshore dollar markets. So um, everyone actually fled to the dollar because this created a big instability, everyone actually just like ran back to holding lots of dollars, which is seen the most stable form of currency, which it still is in most of the world. It's amazing. You can kind of go to any part of the world, which um, doesn't necessarily, sometimes doesn't have like the most kind of commonly traded currency and you can probably pay for stuff in dollars. Um, and, but what this started out was because everyone was holding dollars all of the time and because everyone needed dollars, because if you were, China selling metal to India, you would do that trade in dollars. Everyone needed dollars all of the time. There was a constant demand for dollars around the world. Uh, it was what was at the time I think called as like the US dollar's exorbitant privilege over the world economy. Um, this meant that the US could borrow money extremely cheaply. Any time that it wanted to borrow money, it could just um, borrow it for like very, very low interest rates because dollars were constantly in demand. It also meant the U.S. could spend dollars very, very uh, it, because uh, because it could borrow so much. It could also spend that borrowing on you know domestic stuff, but also on buying up goods from the rest of the world. So this is that bit where the U.S. is buying up all the world's exports. It's buying up all of China's exports. It's buying up all of Germany and Japan's exports. A lot of world, you know, right now Germany is a little bit screwed because America's just put up. Um, uh, tariffs on protecting their own green uh, car industries. Germany was relying on this idea to build loads and loads of like electric cars and sell them to the American market. Uh, but now America's kind of screwed that because they made their own cars cheaper and Germany's kind of pissed off. So, so over, over many decades, uh, a large number of countries around the world, especially fast growing economies, were based around uh, the idea of um, America buying up their stuff buying up the cheap stuff that they made. On the flip side, Americans got cheap stuff and got to use it. And then everyone makes those a profit. That profit is in dollars. That, those dollars then can go back to the US, maybe buy some US stuff, but there's not that much US stuff to buy, or maybe um, just uh, go into the biggest um, uh, financial center in the world, which is Wall Street. So essentially, every, as you can see from the arrow, like everything, stuff and money all ends up going back to the US. Um, 
Oh, this is like a this is like an interval. I'm sure they're up, so I'm not worried. <laughs> the advantage of astronomy is it's not built into the marketplace. It's basically behavioral economics. It's been done for five thousand years. We always like to say that of the four things in the marketplace, which are fundamentals and technicals, inside knowledge and astrology, astrology is the second best forecaster. Uh, inside knowledge is the best, but it's not legal. <laughs> so astrology is a little bit like it's a form of inside knowledge. Yes, except it's perfectly legal and ethical. <laughs> We have uh, had our own so <laughs> but not about that. Anyway, the uh, no, it's it's perfectly public information. It's nothing. We're, we're not manipulating. We're not doing anything. Okay. Okay. The Trump factor we talked about before because Trump is very important. He has a very good horoscope this year, not the horoscope we had in 2016. So I want to repeat it. That's just why we could say 14 months in advance that he was going to be the winner when he didn't even have 5%. It was just an A plus horoscope. His horoscope now is sort of B plus to A minus, which is good. Hi, this is Henry Weingarten. We're at the Princeton Club in New York. Uh, it's Friday the 13th, 2020. The markets have been rock and roll for the last two weeks. Gold is right there, 15, 25. Or if you want to get another one. Let me give you this. And the fact that gold's being dumped is a good sign. Yes, well, we like it. I'm a Leo, so Leos love gold. Sorry about that, but I'm not listening. That's okay. Get that guy's one. I'm not judging. And here's gold. Good. The issue is. When anyone trades the market, says, what is your age? What do you know that other people don't know? Or when do you know it? So what is the issue? Good astro financial astrology is not built into the marketplace, and therefore it's an edge. Those 20 to 30% of surprises that we can identify is very, very profitable. Traders delight. You're a trader, best of times. Let's see what the market's on. Hopefully they're still up. I remember being at, having what we call a pro check, and I was looking at this, and just like now, deciding what the market was. And this little kid looked up at me and said, are you playing a game? I'm thinking I was playing Pong or one of the computer games. And I thought about it for a moment. I said, yeah, I'm playing a game with the whole world. And that's one of the ways how I defined <laughs> stock markets. You're playing a game with the whole world. Um, that's uh, the wonderful I'm sure. uh, Henry Weingarten, who's a financial astrologer. I started making a film with, that's the only, that's the second time we shot together. I, as you heard, it was March 2020, so the pandemic kind of put a bit of a stop to that. It might still happen. Um, but, um, but yeah, that, that, so I, I, I wanted to use that just as a, a segue to get out of um, 2000 and you know, get out of the Bretton Woods two period and jump forward a little bit in time. So you had this kind of dollar world for a long time. The dollar world was massively um, like doubled down upon, but on after 2008, because uh, the way that the, one of the ways, the most important ways in which the US basically um, rescued a lot of other countries financially, um, even though the prices was caused in the US, the US uh, was able to uh, pump a huge amount of money into many other countries, and it did so mostly to its political allies. So it did so with like many of the Western European countries, with Singapore. I think it was a bit of a debate around whether they should bail out Brazil or Mexico, but basically it bailed out a bunch of strategically important countries uh, to itself. And after this, it was like the dollar is uh, becoming more politicized. It's it's it kind of it's a reassertion of the U.S.'s power over the world. Uh, but also a, the, the dollar is no longer just this kind of background condition that we accept as like a sort of natural kind of monetary situation. It's something that's being specifically and strategically used uh, in a very, like, in a, in a crisis kind of way. 
Uh, and you can sort of see also this, the, the use of um, central bank swap lines has massively increased. And there are all of these other arrangements now coming into end 2020, where another such massive crash happened, which was the almost the very day I was filming with Henry in that video. Um, I think the day after that, they announced like, a, I don't know, like half a trillion dollars of like money released from the Fed into the markets or something. Um, so you start to see a kind of like monetary geography appear. Um, and, and this is after 2008, one central uh, European central banker was like, oh, it actually looks like we became the 13th district of the Federal Reserve System. Like you know, we, we, our, our financial stability was depended upon um, the, the, the Federal Reserve's ability to co control, to create new dollars and to control uh, money markets and control interest rates. Um, so that's actually jumping a little bit. Um, the point about this kind of monetary system thing is not just like there's, a, there's been a kind of politicization of how uh, this basic um, currency of uh, global trades is being used. It's also like something that was considered like a relative, uh, relatively unquestioned norm started becoming something that was in uncharted waters. Like after 2008, it was a very tentative kind of step into using sort of quite experimental monetary tools like quantitative easing. After 2020, it was kind of full fledged. And now we're kind of in a situation where no one really knows what monetary policy does anymore. Like in a sense, the, no one knows what the rules or what the, the expected kind of responses are. And that's especially because while the 2008 crisis was created by finance, 2020 was coronavirus and thereafter has been you know, things like the war. So these are not things that are solved by um, finance. These aren't necessarily even things that are created by finance. Finance is a very volatile system that kind of underpins almost everything in the world in terms of it's kind of prices and stuff, but um, the underlying causes are different. And that's, I guess, what the kind of poly crisis kind of idea comes about as. So to sum up, basically for decades, there's this world of assets, which have prevailed over the world of stuff as such from which they were derived. But the overlapping crises reveal a mundane yet counterintuitive reality, at least for economists, a world not made of fungible homogenous units of exchange, but made of a fragile choreography of heterogeneous materials. So the kind of um, the point of this kind of fragmentation of both the financial system and then also the monetary system, based coming up from below this different kind of heterogeneities, whether it's uh, ecological crises, extreme weather, war, uh, coronavirus, uh, or merely just like geopolitical shifts. With, that are causing the kind of world of globalization and free trade and open borders for trades to slowly close down as the Biden administration has recently done so, continuing what Trump's policy basically was to, to, to in, impose industrial strategy. In many ways, maybe a good thing in some senses, but also um, to, to actually like close down economic borders to some extent, to have specific arrangements of specific countries and so on. So in, long story short, there are more prices than the price of money. There are more prices, uh, but this is not something that has been obvious to the, the economic kind of situation over really the last like 50 years or so. Ever since the, the great moderation, the possibility of creating, of stabilizing inflation using interest rate controls, uh, macroeconomics has had a, looked at everything broadly as an aggregate system of um, flow of goods and money and so on, which can be controlled by basically changing the valve at the very top. Uh, and the valve of all valves was the Federal Reserve and dollar system. So now people are talking about what could be Bretton Woods three, which is actually a kind of like significant fragmentation of the global kind of geopolitical and monetary system, looking like a lot of countries might be interested in moving away from the dollar because after Russia got sanctioned in particular, but also the general sanction politics of the US, uh, everyone's kind of looking at Russia and going, I mean, whether or not you support the war or against the war, you don't want that to happen to your financial system if you're like in India or China or whoever you are. Um, so like the BRICS countries, but also like I think India and Saudi maybe and China and Russia and China's literally trucking Yuan over to Russia at the moment um, to start. They've all started trading more in their own currencies. 
And you also got funny things like central bank digital currencies for cross-border trade. Argentina and Brazil have just started their own currency for cross-border trade. And then you've got things like um, uh, US banning Huawei and China thinking about not exporting solar panels anymore, which is very bad for the rest of the world because China produces 97% of the world's solar panels. Um, so uh, as um, this guy, um, Zoltan Posa, who's a financial analyst, um, has uh, recently said, quite kind of uh, been shared a lot, um, you can print money, but not oil to heat or wheat to eat. So what he points out in different places is that, like for example, um, what we've seen and after the war is literally a thinning of supply chains. Like literally there aren't enough ships. Ships carry stuff. Ships have a volume, which different ships have different volumes at which they carry stuff. If they have to go for a longer distance around the world because they have to avoid certain countries, because they have to tr not pretend they're not trading with certain countries, whatever, um, then you're literally having to, you, you, you have a global capacity of how much stuff can move anywhere at any given time. And that's being thinned out because there aren't enough ships to carry stuff at the rate that they used to. So the kind of like, um, I guess the kind of lack of redundancy of the system is um, uh, being felt. Um, and roughly this period that we've been talking about since the kind of system, the, the, the world of, of like global money of since Bretton Woods won really is also roughly the period of the Great Acceleration. Um, where you guys know about this idea, like uh, since the 1950s, the kind of, and especially since the 70s, like a kind of massive increase of, you know, it's everything from uh, global production to consumption to population, all of that stuff. Uh, and at the same time, like biodiversity and extinction and species loss and all the kind of ecological um, effects are like um, rapidly accelerated over like the last 50, 60 years or so. Um, so finally, we get to kind of the nature layer, which I'll run through really quickly. Um, it's mostly filtered through someone that Isabel, the psychiatrist, actually introduced me to, um, which is uh, this, this guy called Mutaha, who was an um, a engineer who built simulation models for the insurance industry. And what his work was doing was basically, if you're in Miami, Miami is a kind of weird contradiction because the water is rising about an inch every three years, but the state is um, relies significantly on property developments for, to make any income because it doesn't charge income tax. It's in the constitution not to have income tax. Uh, so, so it needs it's addicted to a property boom, but at the same time, it's literally being swallowed by the, the coast around it and then also being pummeled by hurricanes and stuff from above, which are happening like very, very strongly and more frequently over the last few years. So if you're in Miami, you wanna buy insurance. And how do you know anything about how to price insurance? Well, you go to someone like the company that Mutaha was working for, who basically runs a statistical simulation of about hundreds, no, no, it's like 100,000, 50,000 um, versions of next year's possible storms and like possible hurricanes, fictional weather, basically. It's, it's a giant Excel sheet. Um, and they run that simulation and then they say, well, it looks like there were 55 category four hurricanes per 10,000 or something. Therefore you have a 0.02 chance of losing a billion dollars or something like that. So you create a kind of, you ultimately come out with a kind of golden number that everyone in the industry wants to see. And that number tells them something about how much risk they're holding. And while this is like very technical and kind of Financy stuff like in the situation we're currently in, these are kind of I think of this as like one of the few interfaces directly between climate science, planetary conditions, and um, the the market, which actually ends up running most much of the world. Like you have like a lot of political uh, action, obviously grinding out, hopefully towards well, very hopelessly at the moment. Uh, but then you have these people who are like kind of at the coalface of um, ecological change in some ways, even though they don't really care about saving the climate necessarily or anything like that. But even like a guy who doesn't believe in climate change living somewhere in like Louisiana or Florida or something cares about his insurance premium and his mortgage. And he cares about whether his house will exist in 50 years because that's what he pinned his entire life savings on is trying to give to his children. You know, 
whatever you make of those those beliefs, that there are constraints and there are kind of connections that that kind of like hold the system together and create new constraints on what can happen later. So this this is a little drawing that Mutar did for me when we met. Um, it shows like a house, uh, a three-story concrete house under different weather conditions and how how much damage it might endure depending on what decade it comes from. Um, so this is roughly what the simulation people do. So you've got kind of um, an actual historical archive of things that people have uh, have been able to record. We've got, for example, in the US, you have a roughly 150 years of hurricane history. Uh, fairly good, not very good, but um, better as you get into the present. And then you have like the fact that the climate is changing quite rapidly now or like it's changed near term conditions can are not going to be the same as this, the general conditions that presided over the last 150 years. And so in the kind of simulate climate simulation industries, um, especially ones, well, at least the ones working with insurance I've spoken to, um, you've got this quite interesting thing where they're building synthetic histories. They're building like using statistical modeling tools and casting them into the past so that you can simulate like 50,000 years of climate history, or you, or you can like try to approximate what you believe to be the possible fluctuations of like a much longer arc to look at like what possible kind of super cycles or longer term patterns are, just like you're using that kind of simulation to go into the future to try and like work out um, what possible trajectories might come from different carbon pathways and so on. So this is kind of, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that as the kind of backstops to like the kind of social psychological kind of, the conditions and the kind of financial economic conditions and then also even like the kind of breaking apart of the geopolitical monetary conditions are falling away. It's not like you have like a sort of stable system of private property and land to fall back on. If anything, the kind of conditions of like um, land, borders, territorial sovereignty, like private property as the source of um, value, just quite literally global real estate market as like a huge number of trillions of the global economy and what kind of ownership or value kind of means. Those things are some of the most under threat in some ways, or at least some of the most unpredictable, increasingly unstable. And within the kind of industries that are trying to deal with them, you have the kind of deployment of like huge speculative tools, like simulating thousands and thousands of years of global weather uh, to, to, to kind of basically fictionalize that kind of create possible uh, possible like operational fictions to work with in order to kind of um, develop that layer of, of reality. Um, this is how catastrophe bonds works. We're going to skip this. This is a work that I made in collaboration with Agnes Cameron, uh, which was a insurance market simulator, which basically uh, threw up new fictional hurricanes and had a, had a market of um, bots, uh, part market participants who would trade on those hurricanes depending on their kind of path. So there's a there's a whole other story about the kind of hurricane reinsurance market behind here, um, but we'll probably have to skip forwards that. So the thing I've been thinking about lately is that we don't really have an economics for an impermanent world. Like we don't really have uh, an idea of a system of value which is based around the fact that the kind of ostensibly most uh, grounded, stable, and um, in perpetual, uh, literal ground of that value, which has in history of economics been usually been tied to land, um, it is itself something that is like the subject of its truth is fundamentally speculative, and its permanence is fundamentally in question. Um, so it's to that point that the book is called Catastrophe Time. I've been kind of thinking about catastrophe for a while. Catastrophe is like kata is like overturning and strifen is like, no, kata is over and strifen is turning. It's like this idea of in a, in a Greek tragedy when um, there's an overturning of the narrative. It's kind of like a, at least I've been thinking about it more as like a structural device than it's rather than just something that happens in the story. It's like something that changes the center of gravity of the story or it's like a black hole or something that changes the kind of bends the time and space around it. Um, so if we think about catastrophe as a state of suspension where like all these different kind of layers of reality, if you like, are kind of sent adrift, are kind of 
start to kind of fold into each other or start to kind of touch each other in different ways, what, what you arrive at is something similar to, I guess, um, the thinking, at least I, I, I started thinking about it also in terms of this idea of the polycrisis, which, I mean, polycrisis gets used as a way to think about how there are multiple interacting um, effects which aren't from a single source, right? There's like war, there's there's climate, there's pandemic. All these things might come from different places, have different time trajectories, touch each other in different ways, but they still amplify each other's effects and create bad, unexpected happenings. So it's basically a theory of um, of emergence, of a complexity theory. But the flip side of that is like what you know when when such a kind of set of heterogeneous narrative arcs starts to converge the flip side of it is also to ask you know what held them apart in the first place like what what made the world what made a kind of relatively homogeneous relatively mono driver world even possible what was that what created that narrative imaginary and what was the kind of conditions of, of that structure um, so the philosopher Akim Mbembe uh, recently said this interesting line, which was, um, it may be that we need to let go of this dream of reconcilability. The question then is, is it possible to build anything t at all in the face of this agonism? So again, this, I think this kind of, to me at least, speaks to this question of heterogeneity of like, you know, of coincidence almost. Like it's of how, how, do, how do you kind of put together multiple um, I mean, you can call it fragmented, but that's almost a normative way to look at a, a, a world. It's, you know, what, what has been fragmented? Was there a whole mirror there before or something? Or what do you do with uh, a world? Um, the pathophysicians would call it like something like a world without metaphor, where nothing stands for anything else. Everything is its own thing. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, in a catastrophe, reality and fiction don't necessarily exist in tension, but coincide, shimmering through one another. You need a separation to allow a coincidence. Actually, I just said this, but okay. The convergence of heterogeneous narratives, which begs the question, what keeps them apart in the first place? The re-territorialization of uh, capitalist globalization in a sort of non-normative, uh, non-normative, just purely descriptive sense, i.e., the the bringing back down to earth of an economy created mostly after the post-war period, which expanded and homogenized its kind of made made the world unthinkable as a relatively singular geo-economic political kind of system. Um, that the bringing that back down to earth is also at the same time a deterritorialization of what we call natural history. So, like for example. Um, um, Deepesh Chakrabarti, the historian, will talk about how um, uh, it's only recently the natural history and human history have become the same thing. They become the, 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 the same. There's no backgrounds on which human history sits. They, they become folded with each other. And that kind of, for him, creates a crisis for the idea of history as a kind of humanist discipline. Um, so to end, um, roughly what I've been currently trying to resolve is this idea of thinking about time as something more of a constructive space, I guess, a, a constructive kind of like a, a time as a medium for technical manipulation. So through with, when we look at finance, look at insurance, which are kind of things we actually do desperately need. Like when you look at when you're facing a world of insane uncertainty where there are combined and uneven effects of extreme weather around the world, being able to use an abstraction like insurance to, to allocate resources and need to different needs is a kind of temporal technology, a type of temporal engineering, which is actually very useful. Um, it just isn't useful when it depends on global speculative financial markets to actually make it, to sustain its possibility. Um, so, I mean, things like catastrophe bonds, uh, financial mechanisms, insurance, they, get, they offer these kind of like ideas that obviously their current condition is extremely problematic, but um, they offer these like ideas of thinking about temporality as something that is much more of a constructed, um, something much more like a technology. Um, so what I wrote here was, to think about coalitions for the occupation of time and within the constrained zones of tactical maneuver and constrained because there's this kind of vanishing point or a series of vanishing points, which is, you know, the limits 
there are limits in question. We're feeling limits. Like there are there are limits to the kind of uh, temporal trajectory that we're kind of undergoing. Uh, and there are various kind of narratives of catastrophe and endpoints. Like that's just how our kind of broader kind of narrative spectrum is is coming out now in terms of climate crisis. Uh, within this const these constraints, nomadic counter speculative alliances, whether between military authorities, technocratic planners, political lobbyists, financial collectives like pension funds, which can be organized difficultly, um, and organized labor power, mass social mobilizations, or direct sabotage. So these are just like a collection of different scales of interaction with um, all of them in their own ways, kind of um, temporal and in, in the language of occupation, uh, are required in what Michel Fair calls um, the need to occupy the time that creditors have conquered, to kind of like find these, use these tools which have you know, created the particular kind of warp temporal conditions that we live in and to, um, uh, to, to, to find a way to kind of take that time back in a way, or at least to basically to plan, <laughs> to find a good way to plan amongst um, millions and millions and billions of people in or towards ends that could be um, usefully coordinated for everyone's survival. Um, I think that's the last slide. Yeah. Okay. All right, Gary. Um, um, yeah, sorry, that was a little bit too off on No, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> um, just, just a kind of um, housekeeping thing. As uh, Nadia said last week, please don't use the back doors and don't use this door. So if you need to leave, please just use this door here, and we'll take the interruption of the people walking out. Um, that was that was a lot, <laughs> and you did it really well. And I, it was kind of. Clear as a ah, oh, the kind of details obviously you have to go through mm. very quickly, which is fine because yeah. I think like he wants to present the whole story. Uh, I'm I'm only going to ask you one immediate question, and then I'm going to throw it out because I think people have lots of questions about different points of the narrative, maybe the overall narrative, mm -hmm. and then I'd like to ask you a question towards the end about being an artist, doing mm -hmm. that stuff. Uh, and I think if we do about twenty five minutes. That's okay. Yep. So we'll finish at. Uh, quarter past twelve. Yeah, so all right. So it's it's basically I think you you set out a story um, as well. One I was interested that you, you didn't really use the word neoliberalism, which is like the go-to term for this moment. You're describing that we're coming to the end of. Um, so we can have that as a sub question. But the the period of um, asset capitalism or assetization. Mm -hmm which is in a way a better term to describe technically what's going on in terms of why finance takes over. Because finance, as you said in that slide, between the employment dominance mm -hmm. and asset dominance. Uh, finance doesn't really care what the asset is. It could be labor, it could be a factory, it could be a derivative, it could be an artwork, which then explains the emergence of, or the kind of bubble, the kind of explosion of the art market in recent years as well. Um, the, the period of facetization is also the period of globalization. And you spelt that out, I think, you know, clearly enough, given the, cons <laughs> given the constraints of the talk, it wasn't you, it was us. Uh, uh, given the, yeah, uh, it, it's the period of globalization um, and assetization is also due to uh, world dollarization as well, which Mona mm -hmm. Ali was talking about mm -hmm. in the first talk. Um, and what we're, what we've seen since about 2016, like that was the sort of peak moment of Brexit, Trump, and the rest of it, is a period that's now increasingly called deglobalization, which is also to do with the shrink back in cross border trade mm -hmm. from about 20, well, after, after the 2000 crash. Right? So there was a kind of, uh, for, for all of the reconstruction of the global economy through swap lines that you showed in the two slides with the blue dots. Mm -hmm. Um, there was also a kind of nervousness about cross-border trades at that time, and there seemed to be some kind of pulling back to thinking about uh, reducing the reliance on, on exports mm -hmm. uh, to kind of secure economies. So there's been this kind of move towards deglobalization. As I said, Brexit is kind of a clear indicator of it in, in Western Europe. Uh, Russia is another indicator of it in uh, Eurasia. Trump is an indicator of it in North America, and Bolsonaro, Brazil, and you know, it's, it's got precedence with 
people like Duarte, Modi in India and so on and so forth. So de deglobalization is partly nationalization, which is kind of the overt political sense that's been around mm -hmm. in a kind of dominant nation takeover way since uh, sort of 2010-ish, I think. -ish. Mm -hmm. Um, but as you were pointing out, there's a kind of important aspect to do with export markets and de-dollarization as well. Um, but the, so, so the, the usual narrative that you see in sort of financial media and so on, financial journalism, is a movement from globalization to deglobalization. How do you, how do we deal with this deglobalized period? But you seem to be suggesting something else is going on. So the the um, you, you kind of set up a narrative where there's almost like a uh, return of the repressed. Mm -hmm. right? So the period of assetization is everything can be financialized because mm -hmm. we turn into an asset. And then now what we have now is actually real material conditions, mm -hmm. like how much oil is there in this country as opposed to that country? How many ships are there? Mm -hmm. Is the Suez Canal blocked because mm -hmm. one ship didn't turn properly, which, which produces yeah. huge crises in supply chains. That's the kind of return of the of the mater materiality of global mm -hmm. trade. And that that materiality, which is also to do with war, uh, food, energy, and so on, means that assetization uh, can't, can't um, successfully lock into itself mm -hmm. in the way that finance requires, which means the financial organization of the planet, which is the period you're describing mm -hmm. of the Great Moderation, can't work in the way it used to. So we're, we're at a period, I think, I think the narrative arc is setting up, is that we're, we're at a period where uh, sort of global systems, planetary systems, uh, you know, in, in, their, in their globality, are still relying on asset finance, mm -hmm. financial assetization. Um, but it's just not working in those terms, right? And, and the kind of material conditions of how we get the basic means of, continuing to be on the planet, um, a kind of intruding upon the kind of successful construction of that. That's not the same argument against globalization as deglobalization. It's like another term. Yeah. And I, so I'm kind of wondering about, because um, deglobalization isn't presented as catastrophic. It's just like another crisis mm -hmm. that we'll get over. We'll reconstruct capitalism, both capital in another, um, we'll reconstruct national capitals, capitalism in other ways. But the, I think I'm trying to get to the um, all overness of catastrophe that you're describing. Because, because as, as global, uh, hold on, as financial globalization is inadequate to this material resurrection, um, it's still, it's, it's, it's a kind of um, breakdown and catastrophe for the planetary system, right? which has been constructed through that, mm -hmm. through that asset formation. So it's partly about where the catastrophe is happening, which I think is everywhere. And that, that would be another way of thinking of the crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's partly about where you sit on this globalization, deglobalization model, which mm -hmm. I think are the more common terms for speaking about this. And then thirdly, it's about Insurance as the mechanism, because insurance is always insurance of this or that, or a particular mm -hmm. so cyclone is here. Mm -hmm. It's going to be uh, sea level rise somewhere else. It's going to be fires in another place, desertification somewhere else, crop failure in another. So, mm -hmm. so there's always very local moments of insurance. Um, but but there's something in your argument which suggests kind of you know planetary scale consideration of the catastrophe. Yeah, okay, let me try and pass all that through. Um, okay, the globalization, deglobalization thing, I, my understanding is that, and it's, it's, it's a little loose, is that while there's talk of deglobalization, it's actually very difficult, it's very hard to, you know, I, something I'm consistently being kind of interested in is like, kind of what are people actually doing, this, despite the kind of narratives, ontologies we might apply to, to things. And my understanding is that it is even with the war in, in, in Russia, like despite the kind of appearance of that should massively rearrange all of the order of things, the actual amount of, like I say, cross-border trade and stuff is not decreasing very quickly at all. 
as it's, I, I, I mean, it might just be a statistical thing to, to look at, but um, so with regards to the assets, assetization side, again, I, what I kind of think, or at least what I learned through thinking and wondering about this stuff and reading around it was less the kind of can the particular um, ontology of assets solve this world just like it solved the last. It's more that, oh, this particular economic set of norms, this particular idea, this normal economic world that I've spent my life in um, is, is actually a very contingent situation based on a very asymmetrical and deeply um, uh, structurally unsustainable situation. So for example, like, you know, China wasn't going to be a cheap exporter forever, and it's no longer being that. Um, so just the kind of realization that like that that story is actually a very specific story, which does have an end, and, so, and but no one seemed to to be like for, for I don't think it, no, it's only recently that people have been talking a lot more about the dollarization and this kind of thing. It seems like uh, I mean they're probably always like quite kind of right critics, um, but at the same time it's, it's it does seem like a return of the repressed. It seems like a kind of you know I was thinking a lot about this um, whether it's like psychoanalysts or Marxists like the idea of the fetish as like the 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 lie that. Uh, I think it's like for um, the Canians, it's like the lie that contains the unbearable truth. Uh, although I that kind of like holds a, 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 a veil to the unbearable truth. And obviously for Marxists, it's like um, the, the the commodity, the, 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 the hiding of social relations for like exchange relations. Um, and so the, there is something about like that kind of return of both the repressed, um, let's say fetish of the market, the idea that the market is a good distributor of information, is a good kind of like allocator of resources, is going to resolve all these problems for itself, uh, as well as the return of like the actual material specificity of things, uh, like like the, the oil and the wheat and the boats and stuff. Um, that does feel like a massive kind of, it seems to be interpreted by the market and by the, the world as a kind of sort of like shock to the system, like a kind of, uh, like a catastrophe, like a, a moment where rather than having slowly prepared your way into a changing set of conditions and a phase transition in the world, rather a moment where people are very surprised and don't know what, what they're doing and don't know how to interpret the near future. And the way that I think that the reason that sort of is, is also a temporal one because everyone is in lockstep to particular structures of temporal consideration, like whether it's, you know, the most in insurance, um, okay, I'll tell you a story actually, the, the, like an insurance contract is like usually one year, maximum like two or three years for these like massive um, catastrophes and stuff. And I actually like had, yeah, one part, I had a conversation with the chief research officer at one of the modeling companies. And he said something along the lines of, um, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to build models for like 2100. We're trying to build like uh, different carbon pathways and different kind of like um, th simulate different kind of possible conditions that the, the world, depending on different policies, might take. But we don't have a client for these models. Hmm. Like we don't have someone who is willing to, we, we're just building because we, we think they're going to be important. <laughs> but we don't have anyone who's from essentially the market side who's willing to consider them important yet because everyone's kind of like horizons are both very constrained and also constrained with each other because I guess you're competing over particular pieces of time in a sense. And then you go into like political cycles and it's like, um, they, you know, we, it's kind of crazy that we get like financial reporting is basically like weather reporting or something. It's like any major event happens, you hear the market's reaction mm. first. Um, so the, yeah, I, I guess I think about it in terms, of, in terms of these kind of very lots of locked together kind of temporalities and all of them really all very short. Like all of them ultimately really short and like unable to interpret anything in a kind of um, longer span that would be require this kind of like active planning and transition to a different set of conditions, which is what arguably I think creates this kind of return of the repressed kind of right. situation. Um, 
the insurance thing I still have to think about. I think um, there's something, insurance contracts are really specific. They're about people fighting over, no one wants to pay out insurance. Everyone wants to collect insurance. Mm. Uh, so they're about, the contracts are always about um, very specific uh, conditions. You know, the WHO, for example, actually released a pandemic bond, um, like a catastrophe bond for pandemics in 2017. Um, and, you know, obviously it was a great test case in 2020 to see if it would work. And basically, uh, I don't know the specifics, but no one wanted to pay their billions out, it turned out. People who put bought into this financial instrument didn't actually want their money to go towards a pandemic. They wanted to make the excellent returns that it offered. And so when the pandemic came, there was so much argument over, I think the, the conditions were very specific. They were like, you have to go, the disease has to cross six countries within 20 days or something, I don't know. Like very specific conditions were attached. Didn't the small print. But yeah. Well, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> and so there is a kind of active set of like misaligned incentives in some of those structures anyway. But I do find it conceptually really interesting that insurance is one of those spaces where very specific conditions come attached to very specific real world mm. things. And you see that kind of historically, like even in the French Revolution, when they when they stopped, um, when everyone was, you know, everything was in disarray, everyone was killing each other, there's new calendars, new money everywhere, local currencies everywhere. They started writing contracts that were attached to like the amount of metal in the coins rather than the face on the coins. So, you know, as you as you get into this kind of temporal disarray, you start digging deeper into what you think of as the material truth, mm -hmm. <laughs> closer and closer to the metal, if you like. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of a structure I'm, I've been kind of quite fascinated by. All right, I'm going to just throw it out. Um, if you have questions, they don't have to be like overarching questions like mine, but just for instance, there's a question I think frankly Nina was back to help us with the microphones. Thank you. Nina, can you just check if that one works? It's, it's muted last. Yeah, okay. Relating it back to what you very first said about um, the dopamine system and psychosis is that like part of that is seeing patterns where there aren't mm -hmm. and synchronicity synchronicity where there isn't. Mm -hmm. um, and so essentially we're in like a very irrational system where like you know maybe the king's wearing no clothes, there is no pattern, but we're all <coughs> pretending that there is. It's sort of like a mass psychosis. Um, and I get that. And then I was sort of connecting that, like, in, in a way that, like, insurance is a canary in the coal mine because their model is built on having more people pay, you know, for bad things not to happen. But as, as more bad things are going to happen, they're going to start to have to raise premiums to continue mm -hmm. to make a profit, which people won't be willing to pay. Mm -hmm. um, and so I got those things. But, like, for me, what I would like you to speak more about is, like, all of these things seem to serve people in power, like the asset system. Um, you you know you don't pay taxes on assets the way you pay taxes on income. So mm -hmm. it's sort of like you know people are always going to continually. Um, this is going to be part of American politics that's very difficult to stop because it's serving people who are already rich, are basically mm -hmm. getting free money, and like you know uh, like similar to the two thousand eight crisis would be like the student loans, and it's like it's very good for Yale to just like keep being able to raise that tuition and the government just keeps giving mm -hmm. money for loans like this is working for all the people in power so essentially like for you um because you didn't talk a lot about power like what is it that would be any reason for this to stop because like if only the only person seeing through it is Anna Delphi and she should be like a little <laughs> anti-hero like go do her own thing like you know how do we like collectively work against this because it feels like very locked in as far as like the people in power are this is working for them at least for their lifetime it's gonna work for them. just just to go back to and Phil and give you a chance uh -huh. to think i was quite interested in that picture of the six uh, grifters uh they all look like would-be art students <laughs> so that, was, that was quite compelling to me they would all be good artworks I know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think um I have like several different answers. I'm trying to work out how they fit together. There is the, 
There is a kind of like super short-sighted answer, which is that I think this is why this situation is, at least for me, is worth paying close attention to at the moment, because it feels like a time when all of these backstops have repeatedly fallen out and that it's not, you know, we are, for example, seeing uh, uh, the, the, biggest, the biggest crash in the asset markets for quite some time. I think it's fallen to like only below like 2019, 2018 kind of values or something, but still like lost like 40% or something. Yeah, it's, it's not nothing. Uh, we're seeing this kind of you know, gigantic consolidation in tech and all of the layoffs. It might be very interesting or possibly quite bleak when the asset market crash potentially uh, and inflation potentially affects um, US property and mortgage markets in terms of like if that has, if some sort of massive ill effect happens in that, that's like a huge situation. So I guess one part of me is thinking op optimistically uh, or curiously thinking, wondering whether um, it is actually a moment where all of the, we're not going to keep seeing the status quo. I mean, most people in this room, considering, uh, including myself, probably throughout their entire adult life, the stock market has never fallen. Like, I mean, 2020 was a kind of a blip, but then it kept just like, the, the, the pandemic was a massive consolidation of billionaire wealth. It was a massive consolidation of asset manager wealth. Um, and so that rule seems to maybe be like no longer assured and maybe even be uh, uh, taking a different trajectory. So there's part of me is like in a sort of short-sighted, curious kind of like um, popcorn-y kind of way, like going, maybe this is actually a narrative shit and maybe it's really, really major. Uh, then, but then there's the much more kind of like, I think meaningful, like much more boring answer, which is also the much more important one, which is, um, yeah, there's this kind of how, what, what kind of levers are there? And I think we are starting to see, they're all problematic in different ways. We're starting to see, you know, more pension fund activism, for example. Uh, the, the kind of general in the industry shift towards like ESG is itself kind of ridiculous, but at least that there is there are kind of like forces moving even within finance itself. And you've just seen things like the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, I think, take a much more activist position as like a $13 trillion fund or something to actually moving, uh, moving the markets towards uh, certain, uh, you know, away from uh, fossil fuels and stuff. As we see that within this kind of fragmenting geopolitical trade kind of situation, whether that just creates kind of bags and bags and bags of cheap coal uh, for other parts of the world who are not taking this particular stance and not in this, this particular network. I think that's kind of interesting because consensus is seen, it seems to be something that's like very hard to, to hold on to. Um, and also going back to the acidification or kind of financialization thing, you have this like ridiculous, again, like artistic conceptual art like effect where um, an oil company or a company investment company invests in fossil fuels, which has a bunch of like really right on kind of investors who like wanted to divest will just sometimes just split itself like it'll sell into like two separate companies of like the good guys and the evil guys and they'll just both keep making money you just charge the good guys more for like buying ethical <laughs> stocks and you charge the evil guys more for like because they make money you know, they make more money because you so so you have this like alien like effect of the kind of market so so yeah i mean it's uh, not, none of it looks particularly excellently promising but we also are um you know if, if there was a good answer to that question it'd be Kind of amazing, but but we are also are seeing these various mobilizations across different spaces, and the only answer that I keep kind of thinking around is like maybe this idea of like accidental alliances. Like, how do you join up the interests of very disparate parties sometimes, and like how 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 do you kind of think about different like societal, structural, economic, social kind of actors as kind of agents motivated by a particular set of constraints and, and needs and demands, and which one of them might be kind of choreographable in, in ways to, to um, you know, towards like upsetting the, the status quo of, of this, this kind of wider structure. But that's again, like a, quite a kind of, not, it's not like a great answer. It's more like, it feels like that's the only way through because there is no one force that is, it seems capable of like shifting this. Except if you follow Kim Stanley Robinson's line, the, the sci-fi writer, I mean, in his recent novel, Ministry for the Future, 
he imagines a coalition of central bankers getting together uh, and creating this kind of carbon backed kind of monetary process. Uh, if that was possible, central banks do have that kind of power, it seems, within this architecture, but it's very difficult to actually imagine that, that happening, I guess, given how even like conferences and stuff go. Uh, but it's really worth checking out that novel for um, the kind of very vivid description of how that might work. Question. Sorry, could you just repeat the title? Um, Ministry for the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson. Yeah, it's hard to imagine central bankers doing it, but you can. Kim Stanley Robinson's imagined it mm -hmm. as a fiction writer, mm -hmm. and presumably the art space is a space similarly where those kind of speculative proposals can start to be. I think it's a high bar to ask you to solve the problem. <laughs> so we're not, we're not looking for that. I think it's more just kind of a description of like pathways through it. Yeah. Uh, all right, are there any more? Even if it's just like moments and there's a question down here in it, the front. I mean, I will say just around the asset thing, uh, while, while the microphone's coming down, um, the problem with, with it's true that um, uh, uh, power is now organized through assets, but in that chart you showed from Kripner of increasing finance insurance real estate, um, and as you said, with, with the kind of collapse of um, labor as a source of income and wealth, mm -hmm. um, people's, personal asset, people's personal wealth is now stored in assets like yeah. real estate, but also pensions, yeah. right? So if you have a collapse in the asset markets, it's also a collapse in people's pension schemes. Yeah. And their futures are gone, yeah. and the future at which they're not earning. Yeah. And so that's, that's a kind of sociopolitical crisis <laughs> in which, you know, I think as we've seen through the period you've described of, from about 1990s onwards, um, our, our everyday existences, and Krippner is quite good about this, mm -hmm. Our everyday existences are very much tied into the success mm -hmm. of financial financial markets in order to continue having asset wealth, if not labor wealth. And I think one of the issues that we're, we've kind of had the beginning of is that if this if there's this um, uh, breakdown in, in asset logics or kind of the, the smooth functioning of asset mm -hmm. capitalism, um, those those um, socio political crises, the psychosocial crises. That you had as the top layer uh, are going to become more and more prominent because they're going to have real, real impacts for everyday people who don't have a lot of wealth and aren't in power, but whose personal individual wealth is tied into those markets because that's that's how wealth is now organised. Yeah, and the flip side, of which I'm really interested in, but did not go into here, is like the kind of sharper end of the social psychological side, which is the kind of acidification of like individualized time and attention and the kind of monetization processes by which you know everything from like crypto to only fans to like these different processes by which um this period of like uh cr you know essentially attaining social network capital in different kinds of ways or at least just the capitalization of everyday life and um everyday kind of information uh is is increasingly like new monetization channels are have, like can't seep so far into those just to kind of find new kinds of like difference that makes a difference kind of moments. So there's kind of like a really, there's a funny kind of like very, um, yeah, the kind of the roots are digging really deep into that as well. Yeah, metaverse is quite interesting. Like yeah. Metaverse. Um, yeah, digital land. Um, it's working. Yeah. Um, I just had a follow-up question to understand a bit more um, time as a technology, mm -hmm. like for who and for what? Is this sort of like the big conglomerates to, uh, you know, break through the different like temporalities, or is this kind of an individual? Like, what kind of um, different time temporalities are available to us? Yeah, um, I mean, I guess in one sense, you know, sort of. In Pence, it doesn't really help to answer your question. The many temporalities are, are sort of available to, to different kinds of forms of, of like being in the world. Um, but I guess when I think we're well, talking about time as a technology or as a kind of medium for technical manipulation, it's kind of like, in a way, taking, taking inspiration from financial operations to, to 
denaturalize the idea of time as this kind of like default linearity, even like historical time, and to look at things like um, look at things like the way that insurance modeling is working vis-a-vis -vis climate change, to think about even the past as not something that's in humanist historical time predictable, sorry, uh, inevitable. You know, the past is not something that's like uh, the kind of angel of history looking at the ruin that's like it's kind of constantly like backed onto. Um, but instead as like a source of information, knowledge, unpredictability, different kind of possible variations of experience. Um, in terms of the kind of much more political end of that, i.e. who actually gets to like shape time, um, that kind of, I think, maybe it's, maybe it's just a misleading way of, or a different way of characterizing like how, you know, how might the stakeholders that are entwined within essentially the market and its system of creating and constraining expectations and like limits upon time, how you might intervene in that. And to do that, you have to do what like people like Michelle Fair talk about in terms of counter speculation, which is basically participating in this, this game of um, temporal claims, let's say through representational uh, systems like a pension fund, where you've got like 100,000 people as part of a particular industry that are actually basically treated as if they were um, like uh, filtered through an asset manager to just like increase their wealth. So actually they, theoretically, it's very hard to, to mobilize pension funds because they're so interested in their individualized futures uh, to, to, to collectivize those kinds of temporal um, concerns <laughs> and uh, shift the direction of that massive piece of investment, which makes up a huge amount of the global uh, capital markets. So like even when you look at something like insurance, which is also heavily based around property and land insurance, there's a kind of, it's just like this crazy image of, at least to me, of like big pools of money kind of washing through the system and back out again, like churning through itself, because it's one, on one hand, the, the um, basically the money that comes in to insure and reinsure like very volatile places, which are heavily built on real estate, significantly comes from global capital pools, which are significantly pay, made up of pension funds, i.e. just like other people's minor investments in their own futures. So, so there's, there's the kind of, you know, this is what banks do, right? I think it's called like a maturity transformation. Like, um, you know, even, even just the, the way what banking is in a way, which is like converting individual people's deposits, which are short-term loans from those people, and converting them into massive loans like mortgages, for example. That conversion is, is, is like a way of turning all these little threads of time and like expectations and like and so on and like put, pulling them into a big bag to almost like securitizing them or something um, and being able to trade them or being able to use them to, to get interest. So this, these ways of converting between and like choreographing different kind of uh, situations in, in time between like individual forms of ownership, collective forms of ownership, massive, super abstract kind of um, totally immaterial forms of uh, things. Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess it's like. <sighs> Sorry, can I? Yeah. Um, so, do you think then the units of time are modeled on the labor capabilities of the human mind? Oh, God. <laughs> That's really hard. That's how I would understand it now with the. No, the yeah. Investment. No. That's interesting. I have not thought about it in terms of like that kind of measurement. I think of it mostly just in terms of how do you create create constraints or how, who has different forms of like political power to to kind of like participate in the things that shape like future possibilities when you have these large structures, whether it's political or market or whatever. Whether the, the I don't I, yeah I don't know if like this is I, I don't have a sense of how the units are measured and how it relates to labor power and human lifespan. There, I think, is where you get into like the effect of altruism type arguments, where like the kind of you can measure the total value of a human life vis-a-vis -vis current market metrics or something, or like put discount rates on. Like, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Well, I really want to take that up. I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> any more questions? Okay. Okay, I'm going to ask one about being an artist. Um, so what I've been struck by this year. Um, and it's only a cross-section of the students on MFA Fine Art, is that there's a really dominant sense in which people feel 
they need to make a story based on their own experience. And it's a bit like the writers, you know, the edict for the writers write about what you know. And it feels a bit like artists are now making art about what they know, which comes from their experience and their histories and history. Hmm. I'm really struck that if your practice and your concerns, you're not doing that based on like your biography. Your mm. your practice is very much about a field of research. Uh, I've known you for a little bit, and I've seen your knowledge and understanding of, of you know, insurance, finance, and the rest of it like get more and more consolidated. And obviously, it's happening in real time. Some of the ideas you're working so polycrisis, for example, is a term that's only come up in the last couple of years. Really. Yeah, last year has been popularizing. Yeah, and it's become like a thematic in the past year, and. You know, it seems like you're interested in including that in your discourse. So there's something about the way in which you you uh, incorporate your research, but also um, I don't know, expand a sense of what you're engaging with through the research. And I'm wondering what if if you have an implicit model of art or an artist in mind when you're doing this. Um, and yeah, I think I think I just want to kind of make a point of it as something for discussion here because um, it, it's to me it's quite an unusual model these days and I think I mean I'm still interested why this is kind of dom- dominant or prevailing mm-hmm. sense of, of people feeling that that it's only from their own experiences that you know work has legitimacy or any claims can be made because I think that's what I'm trying to get to like in your practice in your writing and your theorizing uh, you're not looking for legitimacy for what you're doing making and saying on the basis of your biography, it's just like, it's out there, it's interesting. This is stuff we read about if we read the Financial Times or it bursts through the news when there's like calamity in the finance markets and the rest of it. That that has validity in itself. But it's quite a distinct model of art production. And I'm just wondering mm-hmm. whether you uh, consider that or whether it's just something you get on with and you're not terribly bothered about. Mm. Yeah, I guess, I mean, the one sort of narcissism that art school puts in you, I've noticed that, that it sometimes, it genuinely becomes like, you know, there are wonderful, talented people that I know that didn't go through a particular type of training where you were given very, you were taught almost nothing, but you were told consistently that you were an artist. And that... <laughs> Was in the exam <laughs> <laughs> But No, I mean, I, I guess what, what I was going to was that the, the, I, I guess in a certain sense, it's hard. I, I, I allow it gives you permission to do certain things in the world, whilst also thinking about it as part of a wider practice. I, I guess actually, I do find myself telling students here this as well that like it's okay to have these interests where the nexus is you. Like it's okay that like they don't. It's like it's just you know it, it's it's okay. Yeah. That you are the connecting point between these these different micro or macro kind of things in the world. Um, I guess I, I, I don't have a well-theorized model of like thinking about my own practice really, but I do, I'm quite interested in like, I'm trying to get away from things that are too abstract, but also I'm, I'm quite interested in things that where, where concepts fail. I'm quite interested in this scene between, I guess, broadly speaking, reality and fiction or between, when, between you know, what is what is widely conceptual objects that we hope we take for granted. So that's something that I've been working with for the last few years. Broadly, it's themes like that, like sovereignty, like uh, imaginations, like uh, these things are something I've been quite drawn to in the last few years. Um, at the other side of it is that I guess part of the same thing is that um, I guess uh, I'm quite, I feel, uh, the world is really big and quite complicated and we have to experience very little of it <laughs> and so i mean like a, a while ago i had the opportunity to go to central asia and um via turkey i was in turkey and i thought i didn't know anyone but it turned out my, my close american canadian friends family were there and there are somali canadians who fled during the civil war and his father was a diplomat the, the Somali diplomats to ambassador to Moscow during the Cold War. And I spent an evening with them and got like just the most incredible other version of a totally taken for granted sort of general, not like the specific details, but their ambience, their orientation towards 
world history. Again, not in a nerdy kind of way, just like how we think about what narratives we take and what we take granted was was so so kind of slightly askew to me <laughs> that it was just kind of really fascinating. And then I was like, I had a chance to be in Central Asia and um, also just like realizing kind of the the, the, the forms, the, the types of histories of like, you know, post-Soviet states and like how they formed their new national identities mm. and, and so on and the struggle around that. And uh, I mean, this is just someone learning and having some different experiences in the world. But, but I'm, I'm, you know, I, I appreciate the part of my practice that gives me the permission or a self-excuse to, to encounter things, <laughs> to like cold call financial astrologers or to like, um, you know, like, I mean, Henry's great. Like I still, I, I still edit videos for him for free because it's really easy for me to do. And like, he's, he's, he's like, always like, when you come back to New York, I need to buy you dinner. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, that, that part, that kind of vaguely, journalistic impulses I think something that I, I don't I would hate to lose as part of my practice the, the, the struggle is more like formal consolidation <laughs> um, yeah. oh, that's art that lets you cold call huh? it's art that lets you cold call yeah you get, I, I, I guess so I guess, I guess so I mean it's not for anyone else in a way <laughs> so, so um, alright yeah great thanks thanks Gary alright um,